Wow. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar today. It's great to see you all. I'm David McAdam. I appreciate your time today to join us. We have an amazing webinar all ready to go today. And I think that uh, we'll be, I think, really learn a lot. And I know that the time that I've spent just chatting with the two gentlemen before has uh, really awakened a lot of new ideas inside for me just to start thinking about. I wanted to talk about a little bit about the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers first. Our organization this year, we're coming to the end of 2020. We're still um, working really strongly with all of our members on many different platforms. So our Retail People magazine is still in full, full bloom. We're, we're working on a digital platform for that and it's worked very nicely for us. And we really appreciate the support of all of the people who have continued sending the articles in and uh, making it all connected and working for us. So uh, I thank you very much for that. The directory, our uh, MECSE Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Directory with 875 shopping centers and over a thousand retailers and probably around 290 retail service professionals are members of that. And this year, 2021, the next year, I should say 2021, we're going all digital and all online with this, with this project. And I think you'll find it much easier to manage online and to find all of those contacts and connections you need to. Our voice on demand podcast, again, has been very successful this year. We have around 2,800 to 3,000 followers of what we've been doing. We have a new episode coming out, well, usually about in a month, two or three new podcasts coming out. So we appreciate that. Our, uh, also for our video on demand, our YouTube channel, we've been very successful with that. And we continue to have a number of great uh, thought leaders coming and joining us. And uh, we welcome you, by the way, to come on in and be part of both our podcasts and be certainly part of our video on demand as well. Our webinar series, like we're hosting today, is very much a, a, a lot of fun for us. And we've done very well by it as well. We started off early, early this year. In our first webinar, just to reach out to people when we were in complete lockdown and people were still in shell shock. And that, I think, has been a very big start for us to, for the year. And it's great to have this last webinar of the year today. We also have our, our vlog story, which is, I think, very video vlog. And so we have a couple of our teammates at the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers who go out into the marketplace and take videos of different uh, things that they see and post it. And it's been very successful for us as well. We've had a number of our members come back to us and ask if we can come in and show them what they're doing. And, and so we do that and we post it as well. It's been great. And last but not least, the GVS, the Gregory Vote School for Retail Professionals. We started this year, we had uh, virtually no digital program. Our platform was, was uh, in infancy. And we, started, we started and made the whole thing uh, really from ground up, making 15 minute modules. We now have about 40 of these modules. We have around 230 students that have worked very hard on this. And we have our diploma and our passing, our first sessions and uh, all of the, the things that go with that with our first students are graduating in December this year. And we have so many more people who are signing up in 2021 with this as well. So I think that's all uh, really positive for us. And we have the What's Up retail newsletter that comes out monthly, and each month it has it's full of great stories and it's uh, all kinds of new information and keeping you posted on what's going on, not only with the COVID situation, but what's changing in terms of the retail, what's working, what's not working, what's available, who's moving where, all these types of details are available for you in our What's Up newsletter that comes out monthly. So let's move on to the webinar now and first introduce our speakers today. So we have um, Ben Schesser is a, has been with us for a number of years, is a great, uh, one of our great members of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. He's running a business called Conic and he's worked for over 10 years as a consultant with some of um, Europe's largest retail brands. So he's well versed in what makes retail work. Uh, ben founded Conic in 2014 to make the advanced tools of the retail giants readily available to every business in the industry. 
his clear mission is and continues today to demystify technology. And for people like me, that's, uh, that's fantastic news. He wants to put power back into the hands of the marketeers, so the people who actually can make a difference and understand what's going on. Ben is also a member of the ACROSS member board, uh, advisory board, working with leaders to fast forward the adoption of technology in an industry already and getting ready for the challenges and the opportunities of tomorrow. So Ben, thank you very much for joining us. And also we have with us today, Neil Gemeser. And Neil, thank you for joining us. You're in Amsterdam, I know, and you've just told us that you're in a lockdown mode now until mid-January, which is frightening and I guess new news for the 2021. Neil has over 20 years of international business experience. Neil is the Vice President International for Yardi. It has a dominant position in the software industry, certainly in the Middle East and North Africa region. And Neil's business has included leadership positions with consultancy and technology firms in Asia, Europe, Middle East, and the United States. Strong entrepreneurial drive with excellent analytic, analytical operation and strategy skills. So Neil is no stranger to what makes digital uh, retail work. A uh, successful track record of market entry, development strategies, alliances, revenue creation, and across a multiple product and service categories. And I know that many of us have heard the name Yardi, and it's always great to have you, Neil, with us. And I know you've been a longtime supporter of the Middle East Council and shopping centers and retailers with us as well. So thank you both for joining us. The title of today's webinar is Acceleration of Retail Real Estate Digitization. I know that this morning I was reading an article and I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about uh, Nike. And Nike, of course, as we all know, is a very powerful, strong brand and it has a, a very big alignment with um, their culture and their brand and all of the things that they try and do to reach out to their, their customer base on a regular basis. So there's, there's one part about this that I found was really interesting and the, the CEO started this process whereby they were getting rid of the middlemen, basically, that no more uh, middlemen doing the wholesale trade. So they had the physical score, stores then had become a media channel and media had become the store. And he started that in 2017. And in this calendar year, he's one of the leading, um, one of the leading companies where their stock has actually tripled in value, 150% up in value. Uh, since um, mid 2017, so it's a great story, which leads us into how and, the, and, and how we'll understand the, the global mega trends that are shaping the evolution of the industry and, and what what we can really look forward to. So let me start with maybe uh, Neil. Do you want to sort of kick it off and chat about what you're thinking and what you see for 2021, notwithstanding the fact you're in a lockdown mode to the middle of the month, January? Yeah, so a few things on, on our side. I mean, 2020, without a doubt, has just been a, a really strange year and a disruptive year. Um, what we've seen on a global real estate point of view is that there's been more investment that goes back in tech, into technology and the overall process of digitization. And I think that's really been important in terms of both at a brand level all the way through to the owner and the operator of the shopping centers to the, the developers as well and really need, needing to focus on um, investments in terms of how to connect the entire supply chain. So the supply chain being not just from a manufacturing to a delivery point of view, but really then focusing on the brand and the loyalty of the consumer and how that then also drives additional um, traction into um, either both online sites as well as into physical stores. And, and I think that investment in technology in terms of how consumers buy, market, search, um, receive, deliver, return will continue to be a, a, a super interesting area for the foreseeable future. And I think that those companies that invest in technology uh, will be well placed to be able to continue to service their customer base increasingly well. Ben, talking about your business, and you've come through with the 10 leading ideas for 2021. <laughs> and I know that that's part of where you're headed. Tell me what your thoughts are, where your what your immediate feeling is uh, with where we're headed, where we're headed. Where we're headed. Um, I mean, echoing some of what Neil said, I think 2020 has been a, a tough year, but it has forced a lot of businesses to take decisions way quicker 
um, and way more bravely than they used to. So rather than sort of analyzing and thinking, should we jump, shouldn't we jump? 2020 is about the year when you jump, you just make it happen. Yeah, really interesting looking at Nike. I always, I always use Nike as an example. If you want to look at what's happening in retail in three, four, five years time, look at Nike. They're that far ahead of everyone else, I think, in the way they see the business. Um, we learn a lot from working with Nike. Um, and I think what they do, which is different and echoes what you just said, is they don't look at channels competing. It's not about online competing with offline or malls competing with airports. It's about selling product and however they can sell product globally and optimize also the supply chain, make the right amount of product, get it to the consumers as efficiently as possible. They just obsess about that. Um, and I think what we can learn from them and other brands can learn is, is how do you bring the channels together? How do you break down the barriers between your digital channels and your physical channels? That's what I think 2021 is all about. So that consumers can shop where they want to, not where you want them to. And if we then turn that on its head and look at the mall, I also quoting from Nike, two years ago, I heard them on the stage talking about how they're gonna readjust their, brand, their portfolio of stores. And they're gonna strip out the stores in the middle that are just about product distribution because they don't need that. They can, do, they can distribute more efficiently online but they need the stores to create brand experience and you need the amazing stores in the malls to communicate to your consumers what your brand's all about. You can't do that through a screen. It doesn't matter how clever you get with the yeah. screen. Yeah. So, so I think um, what we need to look at is what's the role of the mall in that journey. And there is a really good role. There's a good position, but it is not just renting space. It's about th always thinking, why would a brand want to be in my mall? And just keep asking why, why, why? Is it to get access to customers? Is it so they can see my brand? Is it they can meet my staff? And that's what I think 21 is about, is rethinking why you exist and why would a tenant want to be in your mall? And if you get that right, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, I agree with that very much too. You know, the other thing that I was reading about a while ago was is that going forward for the shopping center owners, every shop must tell a story. So I think that story can be um, when you're in the store, you're, you're trying to relate to a cultural store story. You can talk about the digital overlay, but I think it's more than that now. I think it's, um, it's really a story about what the value of that brand is. And I know that through technology, we can, we can really impact that in a positive way. And I know from your business, that's what you're endeavoring to do as well with your uh, customer base. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, th there's a nice sort of, story I sometimes tell clients. Um, and we used to work, I used to work with much smaller businesses, so businesses with three or four outlets. And if you said to a business owner, imagine you could get into the head of every customer coming into your clothing store or your cafe and know why they came, what is it they want? When they're looking at your menu, what is it that excites them? If you could read those thoughts, wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be the most fantastic thing? And then you find out where else are they shopping? Oh, after you, they go somewhere else. Well, nowadays you kind of can. If you've got good good digital platform and you've got good customer engagement, you can understand why they came and where else they're going. Mm -hmm. And so why wouldn't you do that? And I think the mall industry has been ignoring that technology for too long and kind of thinking that they don't care about why customers come. And now COVID has made them realize they really do have to care about why customers come mm -hmm. um, and where else they're going. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a big opportunity. I think it's uh, Neil, interesting too, just how, how social media has changed what branding is and the different influencers, right? So I guess in traditional mall settings, you have either the, the owner and the operator helping drive inbound demand. You have the traditional brands themselves advertising, doing different promotions. And now you have this entire group of influencers in terms of who have their own marketing engines to be able to work with brands. And I think that also means that owners and operators of shopping malls in particular have to understand what their reputation is um, in terms of social media and how to leverage then these different social media platforms and influencers to also attract um, individuals in, not just the, the different, um, I would say, segmentation and the mixture of, of the tendencies and the layout um, within the malls themselves. So there's almost more different channels that you need to be aware of today in terms of how that fits into your strategy and, and how it fits into a localized demographic strategy as well. Yeah, I think, sorry, Neil, just to jump in. I, I, I agree. And we're talking a lot about the customer. I think there's also another side to this conversation on, on the tenant side. So, so what I was gonna really lead to on the Nike, Tissa, all the, 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 I think the brands that lead, they're also looking at the malls and going, what do I, I've got a choice of where I allocate my store. I can put it, I can invest online. I can invest through social. I can invest in airport properties or more or outlet. 
you've got to make it easy for them to decide to be in your mall. Like why I mean, lay it out for them? What are they going to get from being there? Um, because they've got so many opportunities now where they can invest. So I, I think, I think that kind of ties together the customer side, digitization to understand why your customers are coming, who they are, what can we learn about their social behaviors through to, okay, how can information help me as a brand decide where I invest, where, where I can sell product. And up to now, those two have been kind of separate. You've got the leasing mm. team and the marketing team and they don't talk to yeah. each other. They've got to talk to each other, I think. Um, but you can see it happening in the more, I think the more forward thinking operators. It's the value of the brand, I think, was what it comes down to. And I think the other thing that I see more and more of, it's the intent. When we're talking about leasing a shopping center, for instance, it's really the intent of the team who's doing that leasing. And if you're not able to really lay out a great story as to why that retailer should be there and the intention, your attention behind it, and it shouldn't just be about the fact that we have this box here and you'll fit nicely in it and it's good for our mix. It's not what it's about anymore. It's a little bit more about what you can do to promote your own business and why you would want to be there. And, you know, that gets right back to my mind, the value of the brand that you're introducing. And I think that there's room now in the marketplace for more brands and new brands and different style of brands. So I think that's, a, that's probably one of the ways that we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. Neil, back to you. Understanding the long-term global mega trends that shape the evolution in the industry. I know that's one of them talking about that. But is there anything that comes to mind immediately about more of a long-term mega trend that you see happening, Neil? Well, I'll say, let me uh, give an example of a short-term impact and, and how I think this is, how we think this is leading to a longer-term trend. And I would say that brand is important, customer demand is important, but customer health, customer in terms of the tenant health is hugely important too. And obviously with retail being hit so hard over the last nine months is that increasingly organizations need to better understand how to manage customer health. So again, the, the tenant's health, so to say, and, and, and how that fits into portfolio health. So being able to understand how, depending on the jurisdiction that one's been in, is the fact that retail malls have been closed based on either government edict and or lack of demand from, from consumers and tenants then generally have refused to pay rent. And so if tenants are refusing to pay rent or asking for additional abatements or, or modifications of their leases, that obviously affects the overall outcome and the flow and kind of the branding of the mall as well. And so a lot of the last nine months of our focus has been is working with owners and operators of, of retail platforms to understand how COVID and these dramatic changes in terms of this economic change has, has affected them but one of the things that we do see is that the, the, the amount of space generally is being decreased. And so as organizations sell more online is that generally leases are a little bit shorter and the amount of the average renewal for a retail space is shorter. And, um, and so that then, or shorter as well as smaller. And so that then also raises the challenge in terms of as an owner and operator of a mall, how can you build in a lease or a tenancy agreement that takes into account a, a certain percentage of turnover that the tenant also receives from online sales. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest ongoing impacts that needs to be addressed is again, the quality of the tenant health. And then also in terms of how to ensure that the, the operator of the retail mall is able, able to capture a certain amount of turnover rent uh, from, from the brands that they actually host within their, their properties. Uh, Neil, what, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing from listening to the shopping center owners and some of our members out there, it's a hard pill to swallow. And the reason it's a hard pill to swallow is because mm. specialty retail uh, revenue, the license revenue that they get from a really short tenants, for example, incubator retailers or pop-up retail, yeah. is, is a fraction in some cases of what they were used to. And yet they still have all of this debt obligation. And, and then we get into the likes of the Into Group and back in the UK and all of the headaches with 17 super regional shopping centers. My view, however, is, is that we're going to get beyond this in the next little while. And we're going to see more about the retailer taking more control about their own destiny and not just being part of the me too factor. They're, I mean, the shopping center and that one, but they're going to have to have a more convincing story. That's, mm. that's what I'm hearing more and more. Ben, how can you help 
these customers, these retailers get a more convincing digital footprint and a better story. Um, I think there's, listening to the conversation, there's, there's two sides to that conversation. Um, what, so one is on how the retailers understand their customers. And uh, some of our clients, without mentioning names, the more kind of forward thinking ones, are quite far down the road that Neil was discussing of, of trying to monetize sales that happen not in the store, but happen because of the store. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might be done, traditionally it's done on catchment, but even that's quite kind of basic. It's trying to understand what, what part, what role does a store play in the customer journey? So one obvious role is, is acquisition. So we help our clients who are the mall operators understand who comes to the mall. We also help them understand who then goes into which store and how much money they spend. And quite a few of the brands we work with are now getting our data from who shops in shopping center X and, and crossing, crossing it against their online data to say, who, where does that person also, sorry, does that person also shop online? And then we start to see the story that they first came into the brand in the shopping center, they spent a hundred and they went on online and spent 500 over a year. And there's a much more interesting conversation then about sharing the revenues that are generated because of that first visit to the mall. So the mall in that story is the acquisition point of a new customer. And malls are really good at that. Mm. It's much easier for me as a consumer to discover a new brand by walking into a store and talking to the staff than for buying online when I have no real information. So, so one is helping them understand that journey. And we do that by gathering customer data. Um, and then the other, it was interesting, we, I've been to... Um, big shows in the US and in the Middle East and in Europe and you see the leasing conversations in the US and they have a big map of the mall hundreds of tables we've all seen this right and they're trying to sell units like you said earlier and then when I go and see a leasing conversation from Value Retail it's a thick brochure about the customer profile and what kinds of customers and the demographic and it's a different conversation it's not about the size of the unit it's about the kind of people that we attract and I think the data we provide helps them go on that journey to actually we're not selling physical space we're selling access to customers the ability it's like a media business like you said the mall is a media business their job is to communicate help brands communicate with customers and we sit in the middle by helping provide that data that, that, that they can have those conversations around and are you yeah. seeing greater willingness then between the brand and the i guess the leasing team to ensure that the the legal agreements i.e the asts have this type of transparency because I think that's the big challenge oftentimes is depending on the brand and, and if they're represented by a distributor and so on, depending on the, the, the jurisdiction, that a lot of that data, there's a feeling that I, I don't want to share that with the, the respective retail yeah, um, operators. That's, that's a historic relationship that's never been very positive. I understand that's, that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I think that varies region by region as well. The, the, the level of trust between the landlord and the tenant it, it, it is regionally different, let's say. Mm. Um, I would say that in terms of mega trends, it's an inevitable truth that they have to cooperate more. Otherwise, everyone loses, right? The mall is That's empty right. and the brand, it's just a lose-lose game. It's a race to the bottom. Um, but I think the interesting thing will be see which side moves first. And I think the mall operators that start to be more transparent will, will probably bear fruit in the medium term quite clearly that they have better relationships with the tenants. Yeah. I agree. I 100% agree with that. And I think that the ones who have been acting first have probably been able to salvage better what there is to salvage given the circumstances we've had. That's right. Uh, Neil, changing the uh, subject just a little bit, Yardi is um, a dominant player in the Middle East market, I know for sure. I know that you have done extremely well here. And I know that you're successful for so many reasons, but let me, or let us all hear why you believe that this year has really cemented your, your foundation as being the dominant industry player in the Middle um, East. Yeah, thank you for those kind words. I think there's there's always uh, additional work that we can do. But um, I mean, I think we've built over the years have heavily invested in the foundation of our operations in the Middle East. And, and I think that's a strong part of the story is that we're dedicated, focused, we're investing with infrastructure and people so that we understand how operational changes need to happen and also how um, things happen across the GCC. So whether one's in Saudi or in Qatar or in Bahrain, et cetera, in terms of the different needs. I think our close uh, relationship with the MSCSC has helped us enormously too, just to be able to relate to the different organizations within the industry so that we take that into account. But I think it's relationships. It's long-term relationships that we've built and an understanding that, that Yardi's invested in the Middle East for the long-term um, 
regardless of the economic or the political situation that that tends to have the top line stories, it's long term relationships for us. It makes a lot of sense, and I would. Uh, that's one of the. That, that's part of my whole business model is it's all about relationships. And if you don't have a strong relationship, it doesn't matter who you are, what you're trying to do, what whatever it is, it's all based upon the the strength and the trust and transparency of that relationship. So, yeah, well, that's well put. Um, ben, over to you just for a second uh, for your next one. Um, how would you suggest we begin to navigate? these challenges that we have right now with the COVID. I know your business, you've pivoted quickly and you've done all that you can do, but how, how to our people who are listening to this webinar, how would you suggest we begin to navigate the challenges that are coming at the end of this year and into 2021? I think um, in terms of the way we think about the challenges, I, I would say, so, so we've, um, we've adapted quite quickly by changing to having much more flexible pricing structure, for example. We used to charge a flat fee per month, and now we charge based on kind of the success of a program, a loyalty program, to acknowledge the fact that the, the world is now much more volatile. And so if we're willing to share that risk with our clients, then hopefully they're more trusting. Um, so I think those kind of relationships help. And I think people should think about uh, it's now, now is not the time to sit down and run sort of six month consulting projects to analyze what you do about a problem. Now is the time to take action. Um, and and the, the beauty of digital technology is you can test stuff out and change it very quickly. You're not building a mall where once it's built, you're stuck with it. You can adapt and change. So I think in terms of how we think about it, it's, it's, it's action, not, a, not, not so much analysis. It's being agile and changing things um, based on the feedback from the users and based on the feedback from your shoppers. And it's having, I think, more flexible models with your suppliers and probably your tenants as well, but your suppliers so that you will share risk. And then there's, there's a more trusting relationship from day one. Um, what we're doing very quickly, we've launched a product which, uh, as well as loyalty based on what you spend in a mall, we're now also tracking location of consumers with their permission so we can see where people are going. This is now a really interesting thing for us to see physically where people shop. Are they shopping from home or not? Are they spending a lot of time at home and then going to them all once a week or are they going to different retail destinations? So that gives us a suddenly a very a new and clear picture on how people are behaving. And we expect to see that changing over time as lockdowns get lifted. So will physically people start moving back to work and how's that gonna drive their spend behavior? Um, so, so kind of nutshell, I think it's, it's time to take action and it's time to uh, understand as much as you can about your shoppers as much as you can, because their behavior has changed massively in the last 12 months. Okay. I think an, uh, an interesting point out of that, Ben, is to is that the operators who then succeed in doing this are ones that don't try to recreate the technology and develop them themselves, but work with partners like uh, Conic and, and Yardi, right? So leverage off of all the best practices and all the lessons that we've learned within the Middle East and through other jurisdictions and build a strong platform. So if you have a strong platform, if you have a cloud-based platform, um, all of that enables one to be more nimble based on changing times. And uh, and so again, the ability to react faster is, is what's going to be able to differentiate the different landlords in ter terms of how they can service the consumer and how they can work and partner with the brands as well. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, David, one, five seconds. No, on go that. Ahead. I, I totally agree. No, go ahead. So, so I think the, I fully agree. We've seen clients in the past that have then tried to build things in house and they're looking at five, 10 year paybacks and the projects get bigger and bigger and more complex. I would say this, but I think it's much better to get a relatively small group of partners, the best you can get, put them in a room together, not separately. Don't try and get them fighting with each other. Um, and, and then you're going to get a great solution that, as you said, is very flexible and can be adapted. Uh, as you, if your partners trust you and, you and they trust each other, that really helps. Neil had spoken about earlier about uh, building trust over the last number of years in the region. It's made a, a really good uh, basis for his build, it's the whole company for what he's been doing and building the business. I'm looking at uh, right now also loyalty programs in the face of the COVID and how they have impacted things. And I know, Ben, you're involved in a lot of that in, in many different ways. Um, but I'm reading about, again, going back to the Nike model, and it says that um, they had this old campaign, it was called Find Your Greatness, and then it got everybody sort of competing or with each other on the Nike Plus uh, sort of a link with things, and now they have 100 million followers on it, which is amazing. Mm. So um, 
but how important is it for everybody to consider having some kind of a loyalty network or something that's going to create a brand awareness in your mind? And, ben, and, you want to start? In my mind, it's really important, obviously. I think um, that, that there's, two, there's always two angles. The angle on loyalty that Nike have done well is get people loyal to using your product, not buying your product. I think that's fantastic. If you can do that, absolutely brilliant. You may be rewarding them based on how much they consume the product, but if you can focus their mind on, on using and enjoying and getting value from your product, it's, that's the best. Which is partly why we've launched this kind of location tracking. We can reward you for coming to the mall, not about how much money you spend, but just coming to my property. Mm -hmm. um, and then the kind of longer term story there is, is that the, the, the landlords have changed from being pure B2B real estate businesses to being B2B retail businesses. And now they're kind of B2C businesses. How, the, the bit you launched with about Nike saying that the, um, the, the store is a media business. I see a big shopping center as a physical version of Amazon. It's, it's a media business, it's a B2C business. And the, the way it, it makes money is by helping brands connect with consumers. You can't do that if you haven't got a connection to the consumer and some kind of brand so that they know that they're coming to an X center and they know the values that means and what kinds of brands and you're building that connection between the shopping mall and the consumer. Whereas previously it was all done through the brand, through the tenant brand, sorry. One of the things that I've noticed in the North American model for their shopping centers, and apparently they have around a, a thousand shopping centers today across the US. But what they've done in, an, in a bid in the last couple of years to reduce costs has been to reduce the marketing departments. I'm not talking about the large marketing spend, mm. but their entire marketing department. And I think that's had, uh, in my view anyway, I think it's caused some serious headaches because they've missed a, a major link. They've saved in the short term, but I think they've missed a little bit in the long term. Neil, what's your view on the connectivity with the, uh, the whole thing? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, U.S. big box shopping malls traditionally have also been anchored by, you know, your JC Penney's and your, your Kmart's or your, your, you know, the different um, uh, large anchors. And I think a lot of the marketing was then tied into these brands too, in terms of helping overall traffic come in. Mm -hmm. And as a lot of those groups have gone under and the shape of the American mall has, has changed, I think now more than ever is organizations need to focus on demand generation and brand and working closely the brand of, of the, the place, i.e. the shopping mall that the, the landlord needs to market, but also mm -hmm. in terms of then working closer with a larger number of brands, as, as Ben also says, in that loyalty program, I think people that underinvest are going to see the, the value of their asset continue to be in question. And, and, you know, part of the challenge in the U.S., of course, is that so many retail shopping malls are owned by, by publicly listed funds that it's just hard to restructure, i.e. reposition the mall, because you reposition the mall, you shut it down, and then you don't have the earnings that don't satisfy your shareholders. And I think that's one of the biggest handicaps of U.S. retail right now is that structurally it, it, it is hard to change, right? Someone has to take a hit as to either the conversion of what a traditional mall looked like without having a retail podium on top or office around it and at that, that placemaking. And I think in the Middle East, it's, it's a much more interesting story because the development minds maybe have been, there, there's so much more development effort in terms of that placemaking rather than just taking and copying what a traditional U.S. mall and the different flavors of that would look like. There have been uh, many discussions and we've dealt with many people in the past who really believe that a community, a shopping center and a retail area, a retail environment should be really a community an area to service the community, a, a sort of a hub for the community. And I think now more than ever, uh, because people are tied down and where they are and to the local, local area where they are, I think that there's been a resurgence in the amount of people who are using shopping centers as a sort of a community for what they have wanted to do. But that also brings into the notion that you need more of the retailers who are servicing the local community in a way that perhaps is a little bit different as a niche or a specialty. So I think that there's some areas to grow there. I wanted to change uh, a little bit more about uh, rapid technology change and looking at what's going and coming, leaving 2020 and into 2021. And rapid technology change, in my view, is one of these things that I believe is going to be a game changer again in 2021. 
but I don't know what that is yet. Neil, do you have any insights? Well, I, I would say it's a it's a big question. Um, um, I think the the insights would be is that there's no doubt that e-commerce is going to continue to have a bigger role. Um, that um, that owners and landlords need to focus again on building the brands. Um, but I think that flexibility will be the nature of the game in terms of expectations. So that the consumer will have greater uh, views of flexibility in terms of the ability to buy, how they can how they can return, and the services that they get around that. And I think that will be you know the big area that consumers will, will demand greater flexibility, and then the brands will 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 request flexibility too, as in terms of how they work with their landlords. Uh, ben, over to you. What do you think about uh, new technology trends in 2020? one that might make a difference to the retail business that uh, we should look forward to? Um, I think, so one of our predictions, our, our top 10 predictions for next year is that we're going to see some billion dollar digital malls. I don't mean pure digital, I mean hybrid. So mall operators pushing hard on their own e-commerce proposition um, through the tenant brands. But we're going to, I think we're going to see some big businesses growing out of that because they're, they're well positioned for that. Um, and we've seen the most forward thinking mall operators in the world investing heavily in the last six months in understanding that. Part of that, I think, is them to be able to serve information back to the consumers. So we do this already. Consumers can search and find out whether the product that they want is available in the mall. People do not want to go down to the mall and then find out that the thing they wanted is not available. Um, whereas before they might be more tolerant of that. Now people are very careful about where they go and how they spend their time. So things like that will really help. The connect, joining the dots on the data so that the consumer can get the same experience when they come into a mall through a digital interface that they get online. Have you got the product? Is it in my size? Can I go in the store and buy it? Um, we're seeing that happening a lot. And then I think something that sort of almost accidentally happened through COVID is, is cash is just getting less and less popular. In some markets, it just isn't used anymore. Um, I personally don't carry any cash ever. And it's really annoying when someone asks me to pay cash. It depends on the market, but we're seeing cash, cash use going down which means you don't need a cash till anymore. You don't need that drawer full of money, which means that the, the whole idea of a cash desk in a, in a store is now being undermined. You don't need that. And it brings the sales experience out onto the shop floor, which I think is really exciting as well. Mm. Um, Apple have done that very well. Yeah, I mean, Apple lead the way, Nike do it. And I think, uh, I think 2021, we're gonna see a lot of that. Consumers are quite happy actually not using cash and it's gonna change how they, they, they behave in the store. And I'm guessing, That's, sorry. Mm. I've seen Alipay make inroads into the Middle Eastern markets now and in, in expectation of large numbers of, uh, of Ch Asian tourists, mainly Chinese tourists coming into the market to, to spend time in shopping centers. But they've uh, started to set up their whole payments schedule as around Alipay and other sources where you just use your mobile phone and that's it. There's no other way of communicating or paying really. So yeah, yeah. I think that's, a, that's one of the futures that we see. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, in the Nordics, there is no cash. I mean, the entire process in terms of whether it's rent roll or any payments, it's all done online and through smartphones and smart cards and other things. I think that's a great example by which there's a benefit to the consumer, but there's also a benefit to the brand and the landlord in turn in terms of the, the cost of actually moving and collecting cash. Yeah. I have had a number of people ask me in the last uh, two, three weeks, and I get a lot of phone calls every day, and they're asking me, okay, so what are you forecasting, David, for 2021 in the first half? And, um, and I had one call yesterday, and, uh, and I'm still thinking about this one because they said, well, don't even plan on anything different in 2021 than was in 2020. And I'm thinking to myself, I just wanted to finish 2020 so I could look forward <laughs> to something brighter in 2021. And this gentleman, who's quite knowledgeable, said, no, no, not until 20, mid-2022 will we have something that we can relate to again that's on a more normal basis. Hmm. Neil, back to you. What's your thought? I, you know, For me, I'm, I'm hopeful to get through the end of this year and look for a bright, sunny future next year. But I do know there's going to be bumps in the road. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, as much as I want to hope that on January 1st, when I wake up, that it's a different landscape, um, I think there's this, this reality that we live in today that 
tourism is going to be limited, um, that um, uh, countries and cities will have these these ups and downs as it pertains to openness, but I think that will all pass. And so I think 2021 may still have some ups and downs, but I think largely is, is things will resume to maybe, in, let's say it's not the normal, but it's a new normal in terms of, of expectations on how we live, how we work, how we shop, how we plan. Um, and I think that will continue to evolve. And, it'll make us all stronger in, in many ways because sometimes you need an enormous nudge to rethink how things are done and to, to innovate. And I think COVID, that's maybe one of the positives that COVID has brought around is that it's forced all industries to reconsider how to maintain differentiation, how to take care of customers and brands and people and community, right? So, one of the things that we very much at Yardi believe in, it's kind of core of our DNA is, is keep our, you know, is take care of our customers, take care of our employees, innovate and grow, but also take care of the communities that we work and live in. And, and I think giving back um, is an important part, but uh, um, that's a long answer to maybe a, a very specific short required response, but uh, no, we're, that's, we're, that's we're, 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 we're hopeful. In other words, um, we're certainly not pessimistic. Ben, over to you. What's 2021 look like? Uh, I, th I think the, 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 your your friend's sort of point of view, I think, I'm a bit controversial, is wrong. It's not going to go back. It, we're not waiting until we recover to where we were a year mm. ago, because that's just not going to happen. I would agree, um, by the way. Yeah. So, so I think, like, kind of forget that. Let's think about how is it going to evolve from now on. It's a kind of new, a new starting point. Um, and so I think that the brands that sit there waiting for life to go back to how it was, the good old days, forget it, game over. Think about how you can operate and the, and the landlords as well, how you can operate in the new world. Like Neil said, everyone says it's a new normal, but what is that? And we can actually figure out what that is. We've got quite a lot of experience now to know what that is. Um, and then you're just dialing up and down the amount of lockdown. That's really the variable, I think, in the next six months. I agree. My, my guess would be by Q3, little lockdown, many people traveling, maybe less international tourism. Um, it's Q1, Q2 that we just don't really know how that dial is going to go up and down, right? And I thought it was getting better. And then suddenly Europe goes into lockdown over the weekend again. Yeah. Okay, we're going to wait and see. Um, but, but I think you really shouldn't, worry, you shouldn't be thinking about when it goes back to when we should be thinking about how can I make my business agile and flexible that it doesn't matter what's happening in, in the sense of the level of lockdown, I can react to that. That's what we're trying to do with our clients anyway. Yeah, well, it makes sense too. I, I think that uh, you can't look back. You can only look forward. I think that's what basically how you have to run your life anyway at any point. Yeah, yeah. But there's a, a tiny anecdote. I'm, I'm now based in Spain, but the, the local mall here, you could visit it. The big stores are open because they can manage the staff levels to do um, digital selling. So they're open. You, can, you can't go in the store. You can shop online and you can collect. That's what they're doing. The smaller stores can't do that because they just can't fund the staff levels. Mm. Why is a mall not saying, right, we'll, we'll club you together or we'll provide some staff, we'll do something so that rather than having 10% of my stores are open, I've got 50 or 60%. I think the mall operators need to just think a little bit, what could they do mm. in, in that next six to 12 months that makes it um, vi viable for the retailers to operate through the mall? And I think like we said earlier, I think the big, the, 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 the lesson is flexibility and partnership. Right. So you can't just see it as a landlord relationship anymore with the brand. You have to see it as I need to help you out during this, this period of time to help your employees and your customers, et cetera. And it needs to be a partnership rather than just demanding rent. And if you don't pay me, I'm going to file a legal injunction against you. Mm. Yeah, that makes well, lots of sense. Some good news. Here, what we've seen is the brands are way more open to talking about these kinds of sharing. Uh, how mm. can we work together? Because everyone's looking at their business going, I got to do something. I got to change mm. something. So, so it's much easier to get senior level, C level people engaging on these conversations. Whereas before, this wasn't their issue, and now it is their issue. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a whole new, different story. Yeah. Um, so, Justin, um, I know you're looking at. Has there anyone raised their hand for questions for the team that we have on this webinar today? And if not, I have some questions to carry on with. But Justin, if you're around, you could let us know. So there was one question, David, that um, is, are physical malls or will physical malls even be a thing of the future or will they vanish? And I think our joint view here is that there will absolutely be a role for physical malls. They will evolve, 
right? And, and shape and form and strategy, but they're not going away anytime soon. And um, they'll always be relevant in people's lives and part of the community. Well, I would agree with that too. Ben, do you have any uh, response to that one as well? I mean, that yeah, question? of course they're going to be part of the future. Absolutely, they're going to be part of the future. Unless you believe in some dystopian future, we just plug ourselves into the wall and, and you know, we all turn up being part of the matrix. <laughs> That's right. It's just how and in what role. And even like you said earlier, David, the community malls have had a, a big boost actually during mm -hmm. lockdown. In some countries, they're doing really well because people want to shop locally. So yeah. they're definitely going to be there. It's just what role they're playing that's changing. Um, I've got another question that I've, um, I've struggled with because I've read about the UK and what's going on there. And, and it's all about uh, street front retail. And so these are more ma and pa shops, long, smaller operators, and what's their future looking like? So we just talked about community and how important that is. And um, uh, let's, let's get some ideas. Maybe Ben, do you want to start on that one? I'm talking yeah. about street front retail and what's the, how does that look going into the next new year? Mm. Um, I think, so is that something that's, because I'm from the UK, that's quite an important part of, of people's social lives. I think it depends on the country, but in the UK it is. And community, yes. And community, yeah. Sorry, social community. It's really important. And it's something I personally believe in a lot. Like uh, I don't want to see malls destroying high streets. I want to see yeah. physical retail surviving, all of it. Um, it'll change, but I want to see it all surviving. So something we, we work with a lot of business improvement districts, which are kind of organizations that group local sort of smaller retailers together with a shared budget so they can help market their proposition. Um, and we work with a few of those in the UK and the US. I think they're really good initiatives where each individual retailer hasn't got the ability or the budget to drive their own sales and footfall, but together they can. I think that's a great idea. And it also means that for the consumer, I'm not talking to 150 brands. I'm talking to one retail destination. Um, I also love seeing it when you see them all being part of that conversation, being probably the biggest landlord in this town center or city center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They need to be in that conversation. It's, for, it's in everyone's interest that, that the, the town centers survive and thrive. And the UK has got some problems there. I think that, that the malls and the high streets haven't cooperated enough. Yeah, I think an example of that, too. I mean, the UK is a good example. I think Hong Kong is a good example, too, where traditionally high street retailers have been pushed out by big brands and landlords expecting huge increases every X amount of months. And so all of your mom and pop shops are gone. And so, you know, similar to what's happening in the UK in terms of then the demand for the rent on a high street because of, you know, Louis Vuitton or another high end brand moved in down the road. I think the expectation of what rental yields provide is imbalanced. And so I think there needs to there too be a realistic expectation in terms of the brands that sit within high street and how they help build community and placemaking and, and get complemented by whether it's your, your bigger malls and or your outlet centers and how the entire ecosystem needs to work together. All right, so the landlords should be doing curating a portfolio of interesting brands that make a good experience for the consumer, not yeah. just maximizing rent. High street's difficult though, right? Because oftentimes high street is owned by individual landlords who are just looking at the individual price point as to what the person across the street is, you know, asking for from a demand point of view. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. What do we all see going forward in terms of um, valuations of the retail world? I know that I'm looking at Canada's home country for me and I'm looking at the pension funds and the haircuts they've taken on the retail valuations. They have their own internal retail valuations that are coming. And I'd like to get your input on what you think of, of that, Neil, so far and where you see it heading again. I think maybe the valuation model needs to change degree too. Right, yeah, so the entire methodology, agree. and 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 so how you traditionally value a property in a retail mm -hmm. mall based on kind of the 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 uh, consistency of the the uh, the uh, tenant mixture, but I think if if leases become shorter potentially, but there's a higher portion of turnover rents and seasonality, which has always been the case, but in terms of then how to tie it back into online sales, I think those are the different levers that need to be looked at more importantly as you look at a retail platform but the question then too would be is that is the retail platform being compared to let's say a mixed-use platform by which you know you have more sustainable income 
right? Mm -hmm. So whether that's mm -hmm. residential, multifamily or built to rent, right? Is it an office block? And so you create something that's more than just a, a standalone retail platform that has more, more um, reliable rents and forecastable uh, type of uh, prognosis for the future. Ben, what's your thoughts on the valuations going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, I, agree. I think the market's probably overreacted in a downwards trend in 2020 mm -hmm. by taking the existing model and saying, if you extrapolate this model, it, you know, the future doesn't, doesn't look great. But obviously businesses are not just gonna keep doing the same thing. You'd be really nuts to do that. Um, and we've already seen them adapting. So I agree with Neil, I think the valuation models have to change. Um, I think the, mar the markets tend to overreact and then correct when, when there's a huge uncertainty and COVID was, no one saw that one coming and no one's ever had that experience before. So um, I think it's seeing how do the bigger operators adjust their models to create long-term value that's not just about an annuity on rent. Um, and if they can prove they can do that, then the valuations need to go back up again. I wouldn't put a number on that because if I could do that, I'd be doing a different business. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different thing. We're coming down to the last um, few minutes. Is there anything, uh, Neil, you want to have? Um... All right. Okay, hold on a second. I've just got something there. I've got a question. How does the digitization agenda make its way further into the physical spaces? You mentioned cash desk, less stores, how spaces need to evolve to accommodate the hardware. <laughs> and tech that will underpin the store as a physical channel? And is the guitar, <laughs> is the guitar on Neil's wall just for show? <laughs> that, thank you, Peter Rowe. Well, Neil, I mean, you, you, you were highlighted with your guitar, so. So I guess I'll take the second question. So Peter and everyone else, there will be a separate webinar in 30 minutes now. <laughs> um, the guitar is somewhat inspirational and somewhat relaxing depending on how I'm playing. Um, I'll answer maybe some comments on the first part of the question. I mean, I think that the space uh, within a mall in terms of the brand space will continue to evolve because you'll have greater, you may have less inventory, but you'll have better or different ways for the, the consumer to interact with the different products and, and lifestyle that the brand presents in store. And I think those are all digital components in terms of of, of how do they experience more than just what's in the shelves and how the stores typically fit out, but more in a digital sense too. So that would be one, one component. Ben? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's sort of the cash test becomes less relevant. I think that the sales happen on the store, uh, on the shop floor, um, which we're seeing already. So, so for Conic, when we run loyalty programs, we use kind of handheld devices that the staff can carry around and we're using that as a way of communicating back and forth between the database and the staff. And I think that will, and they take payment and that's going to continue. It's really interesting about whether the store becomes a warehouse or not. So some brands like Nike have most of their stock on the shop floor and other brands like Apple have kind of no stock on the floor and it's a pure showroom. Um, it's interesting to see which way that will go, but I think the stores, they have to know exactly what's in the warehouse so people can shop them digitally. And they have to forget the idea that you walk out of the store with a product that may or may not happen. Mm. You, the you question make... though will be returns too, right? So increasingly yeah. the expectation is, is do I ship it back or yeah. do I bring it back, right? And I think that impact or that decision has a bit impact in terms of how you continue flow back into the, into the physical space. Yeah. When we've worked with landlords that are, that are launching e-commerce propositions, I think the smarter ones think about the kind of conversation you just said, how can I bring people back into the mall? How can I create a better experience for my consumer but that doesn't mean they just sit on the sofa and shop because that's not good for my mall. Mm. So it's, it's, it's how do you fit into that customer journey, including bringing them back into your mall? David, a question back to you, if I may, is what do you think the biggest changes in the Middle East that you've seen as you talk to representatives of the MSCSC is the composition of the uh, composition or, or strategy of what the tenant mixture is of a mall and how has that changed? And maybe what's the, what are insights in terms of what that will look like moving forward? So, you know, is it big anchors? Is it grocery stores? Is it cinemas? Is it food courts? Is it ski resorts? You know, Dubai is a fascinating place in terms of what the anchor of the mall is, right? Yeah, sure. Well, I could uh, give you a few ideas on that. Uh, first of all, I think that there's been a big push in 2020 with the time that people have found themselves with, 
to try and come up with what, what would make a difference. And it's always centered now around more food and beverage that is going to make a difference to what is on offer today. Mm. The other thing is, is that there's going to be a lot more en- edutainment. So it's not so much just the entertainment, it's edutainment. And I think that that's going to play a, a much bigger role going forward. I think um, also when you look at some of the major shopping centers in, um, in Dubai, let's just speak about Dubai for a moment. Um, even before COVID broke out, there was a huge movement afoot in the major malls to reduce the footprint of the retailers in a lot of these locations that they were occupying. So they would move the back wall forward to make them not a incubator pop-up size, which is only a couple of meters, but maybe reduce it. So you're 10 to 15 meters as opposed to 30 meters back there. Mm. So there's been a big movement that way. And I see that continuing. And that's more on the line of what you were mentioning, Neil, about the idea of having more uh, shops that are shorter term, more relevant, maybe more community focused maybe something that is going to be um, seasonal, for, for instance, or something that is going to create a level of interest that is going to uh, keep people coming back. So yeah. I see that happening. I know that the landlords uh, that are members, we have 875 shopping centers as members of our organization. And I speak to many of them uh, often. And the, the whole idea that they have is, is that, of course, we're not going away, but how can we stay relevant? And I keep coming back to them and say, well, okay, what's your intention? What is your intent? What is it you want to do to help the retailers? Or what is it that you think you need to do to be able to be in business going forward? Mm-hmm. And then it, I, I, I like to throw the ball back into their court because generally speaking, they're looking for answers when the answers are really lying within themselves. And, and that's a difficult question to ask because that means reporting back to the board that said, well, we invested X million or billion or whatever it is. And now we have this much revenue, what are we gonna do? So as we were talking about earlier, I would suggest that there's some, there's still some discussions that have to happen to bring everybody into alignment that it's gonna make a difference. Yeah. Ben, over to you. Is there anything else you wanted as a closing idea? Um, uh, I think I'll get back to, I think it's something you said at the beginning of the, the kind of why, why, why. Um, so, so we're, as I said, we're all about understanding shopper behavior and data and understanding why they're, why they're coming to the mall, what are they doing, where else are they going. I think if the mall operators can think, if I'm both a, a shopper and a, and a brand, why do I want to be in that mall? And just keep digging away at that question. Um, it'll help them understand what they can offer to both sides of that equation. And if they get it right, they've got a really good long-term proposition. And, and dig hard. If someone's coming into a store, why are they going to store, not shopping online? What is it they want to do in that store? Um, another interesting point, I think, that just popped up on one of the questions was, uh, do brands compete or not in malls? So just throw you out some data. Mm. Um, so, so we know when someone comes to a mall, we know which stores you go to, how much money you spend in each store. And without fail, we see that the highest value shoppers shopping what you would think would be competing brands. So your highest value Nike shopper also shops Under Armour or your highest value Gap shopper also shops Ted Baker. Um, so, so stopping thinking about competition between brands and more about how do you group them together to get the most spend from your consumers. Um, I think that's something that, that all or more operators could start learning from. Makes sense. Um, any other questions that we have? Um... I'm, I'm asking the team now, are there any other questions that you um, want to bring forward? David, there was another question. Um, we see many retailers are preferring drive through and standalone locations. And do you think there's a trend away from malls? Well, <laughs> so it's an interesting question, right? I guess it depends on the luxury of space and, mm. and in terms of why you, why one would go to a location if there's only one store in the type of store and, and what drives a consumer into that to, to drive somewhere for that. Now, in California, I would say if that is a in and out burger place, which might be a very California specific type of analogy of one of the best burgers in the world, I would drive miles for that, right? But, you know, how do you bring someone to, to a location? But in general, I would say is this idea of thousands of drive throughs um, is a space constraint and it's expensive for the landlord to build. And that's why you have different forms of malls um, 
in all of its different shapes and sizes, which will, will enable greater value propositions for the landlord as well as for the consumer and the brand to, to be able to market together. Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, Ben, any thoughts on that? drive through pan panacea of drive through uh, I've never been to a drive through but I get the idea. Um, I think, I, yeah, I, I agree with what Neil said. It's, the mall's about discovery. I think people still want to discover new experiences and new brands. If you, if you specifically want one product, you know exactly what it is. Um, unless I can only get it in that mall, there's other ways I can buy that product. If I know exactly yeah, you'll, what you'll, I you'll buy it online. I mean, buy that's online. the other yeah. thing. It's right, you know, assume it's not a, yeah, I mean, even with consumables these days, so. Yeah, unless, unless you're a grocer, in which case that drive through makes sense. You want to encourage discovery and people want to discover and they want to enjoy their lives. So uh, again, think about how you can create that discovery environment. And yeah. that's, I think, increasingly the malls should think about themselves as acquisition channels for the brands. The biggest thing you can do for a brand is help them acquire new customers. And then they can monetize them online, offline, in your mall. There's a whole way, many ways they can monetize that customer. What they're fighting for now in the new world is not so much share of wallet, it's share of customer attention, it's acquisition. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine, David, that one of the biggest challenges in markets is how do you then, how do the landlords and the brands staff stores and ensure that the customer experience is right from a concierge point of view, from a cleanliness point of view and others? Be curious in terms of what does the MS, M, M -E -S -C -S do to help educate operators in terms of how to ensure that uh, uh, the landlords provide great service? I think that um, there's a couple of answers to that question. First of all, we're, we're very much supported with our Gregory Vote School for Retail Professionals. We try to educate it in every level that we, that we can and, uh, and help people to do that, even as far as virtual merchandising, visual merchandising. And um, the, the challenge is this, and, and that is, is that first of all, when there's not a lot of money around, then training flies out the window. That's part of it. The other issue is, is that the people who are the storekeepers of the shops, who are the staff, they tend to be reasonably transient so that they walk out the door with that training under their belt and then mm -hmm. they have to start all over again. So, and in the retail world these days, there's been probably a shortage of turnover capital for them to, to reinvest that way. So those are the, the short answers, but I can suggest that it's an ongoing challenge. And it doesn't matter whether your shop's in um, Hong Kong or Bangkok or LA or, or in Dubai. I mean, I think everybody's, everybody's facing the same kinds of challenges. And my view is, is that um, when you find someone who has an ability to create a great relationship instantly with somebody who walks in the door, then that's meaningful for you as a business owner to try and cultivate and train and establish and, and uh, enable that person to do more well for you. So yeah. yes, uh, our organization is very much involved in that, but I can also suggest that it's, um, it's challenging to keep it with the revolving door that generally happens. Yeah. Uh, anything else anybody has to uh, input? Any thoughts? I think, yeah, I, I, sorry, no. sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, no, off to you. Um, I was going to say it's, um, there's been so many lessons learned through 2020. And, and I think if there, there's one lesson that we all learn is that nothing is ever constant. And it's, it's about how we all react to change. And, and I think if one looks forward in terms of 2021 and beyond, as the ability to leverage change to differentiate, invest, and innovate, it's a time in everyone's lives to be able to do so. And, and so we certainly encourage kind of as we hire employees and as we work with clients, as, as, as we continue that, that uh, drumbeat to, to be optimistic in terms of what needs or what can happen as long as one has the right mindset to make it happen. So um, that's kind of, that would be my closing remarks as we look forward to ending 2020 and starting 2021. Ben, any thoughts? Uh, very, very profound, Neil. Um, it's similar, I think on a webinar a few weeks ago, there was the CEO of, of Lewa, Mark Testimony, who said 2020 has actually been quite a good year for the business in the sense that it's really forced you to, to look carefully at your processes, your people, where you're being inefficient. And a lot of, I think, probably every business on this webinar, mm. we've managed to reduce cost. And think, hang, hang on, we were, we were being inefficient before. Um, and we were not being as customer focused as we should be. And we were not being as, as clear about our vision as we should be. So... In a sense, it's forced us, whether you like it or not, to be a, a lot clearer about what we need in our companies, how we serve our clients best. Um, I think it's forced us to build long-term relationships because 
we probably all had to give um, price reductions during this period or rent reductions. You've had to make sacrifices to keep your business afloat. And that's a sign of a long-term relationship. My hope is that we don't forget all of that uh, when, when lockdown's finished and that we remember what we've learned. And we don't just think about cutting costs for the next three months, but we think about what is our business going to look like in 12, 18, 36 months. Um, and I think the, the best players are doing that. We're, we're looking longer term and investing longer term. Yeah, yeah, totally I agree. agree. I would agree. I wanted to, first of all, start by thanking both of you for uh, creating and attending and making this webinar such a great success and nice chatting with you both again. It's been my great pleasure to have you both on. I also wanted to thank uh, all of the people who are listening to the webinar with us today. But most importantly, I also wanted to thank uh, the team at the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers because I know that um, it all looks pretty simple to see all of this happen and it all just kind of flows and is very lovely. But I know behind the scenes, there's a lot of um, background work that has to take place. There's a lot of detail that has to be done. There's a lot of proactive marketing digitally and all the other ways through phone calls and other ways that has to happen to get the audience that's come to enjoy what we've done today. So I wanted to first thank them and, and all of them. So they've done a fabulous job again, and I thank you for that. So uh, unless anyone has anything else to say, I think that's it for today. But I'd like to thank you both again, and I look forward to catching up with you both soon. Happy New Year to both of you. And uh, here's hoping lockdown doesn't go past mid-January for all of us. Thanks, David. And uh, thanks to everyone on your team for, for putting this together. And um, happy holidays and, and be safe. Same.